Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast, My First Season. My name is Greg and very special guest today. This guest was referred to me by someone, oh, I don't know, I'll call him Jim. Yeah, Jim is from California. He knows who he is, so I want to thank him for, for getting a special guest to me today. Because even though this episode will air in the new year, we are recording it in December. And this geo just finished working for Club Med at the end of November in Turks and Caicos. So that would make her the most recent ex geo I have ever had on the show. She is from San Francisco. Her first season was in Sandpiper in November of 2018 as a meeting and events coordinator. That position wasn't around when uh, I was around, so I'm pretty uh, excited to talk to this geo about it. Without further ado, please help me welcome to my first season, Sydney. Hey, Sydney, how are you? I'm great. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. It's really exciting to be able to share my story and my experience. And for whoever's out there listening, thank you for tuning in. So I'm excited. Let's go. All right. And you, yeah, like we said, you just stopped working in Turks at the uh, end of November, and now you'll be home for Christmas, which is something that you don't get to do usually if you're working in Clement. <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, it's been three years actually since I've been home officially for the holidays, whether that was Thanksgiving or even my birthday or Christmas, New Year's, Hanukkah, all the above. It's been three years. So it's a little weird being back. My family's absolutely happy about it. But for me, I'm just so used to the hustle and bustle of club med geo life during the holidays, whether it's me dressing up as Santa's helper or uh, who knows what else, you know, they always have some sort of new year's sparkly costume or whatever the costume may be of that day. Basically that's what I'm used to. So it's weird not doing that this year. (laughs) So on Christmas day, will you still put on feathers and a boa? Is that what you're saying? Well, in honor of Club Med, I just might. Granted, I am Jewish, so, you know, I, I my grandma may not be too happy with me. But Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You're, you're Jewish yeah, and you have, a fr- you have a French last name, so, I, yeah. uh, and, and you're American, so. Ha- well, ha- technically, ha- I'm half and half. So my dad is from um, Laval, and so he uh, grew hold up. up hold up. Are you saying yeah. your dad is Canadian? He is. He's French Canadian. Oh, you didn't tell me that. Okay. Oh, I have so much to share with you. Okay, great. (laughs) (laughs) No, yeah, he grew up in Laval there. His mom and uh, my aunt, so his sister, are still there right now. He actually didn't know any English at all, had never left Canada up until the point that he actually started working for Club Med. So my parents were geos as well. So I'm a Club Med baby. You're kidding. No, no. It's the truth. Yeah. I grew up born and raised into the Club Med world. My parents were friends for the longest of time in Club Med before they officially got together. And I came along three years after they left Club Med, but because of their connection with Club Med, I always grew up vacationing in Club Med. And um, my dad is actually now the circus circus expert for the North American zone of Club Med. So he's constantly traveling between all the different villages in the North American zone that have circus. And he's basically responsible for the rigging, the maintenance, the upkeep of all the circus equipment, and he trains the circus teams. So Club Med has been through and through my entire life. (laughs) And I'm guessing when he was in Club Med, his job, he was a circus geo, right? Well, he actually started in the kitchen. He went to culinary school in Montreal And then that's how he actually got recruited by Club Med. They came to his school and said, you know, hey, there's this amazing opportunity, beaches, sun and girls. Who's in? Yeah, you tell anyone that from Montreal. Yeah, we don't need to know anymore. You had us at beach and girls. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. And like I said, my dad never spoke English. He never left Canada. So he said, you know what? I I feel like I need to do this. So he started in the kitchen and in his free time, he would go to the trapeze and he had this talent for it. He didn't know he had, and he loved it, fell in love with it it, almost instantly. I think he did maybe one or two seasons as a a chef de partie. And then after that, he actually quit that job before he even officially had a confirmed circus position. Fortunately, they liked him enough to bring him on and he was circus ever since. So he eventually ended up being chief of circus in a couple villages. He's hopped around quite a bit. My parents were geos in the late nineties. So really early, early nineties to late nineties, kind of that mid nineties range. And what did, uh, what did mom do in the, in the resorts? She was a nurse. Okay. My parents actually met in Ixtapa in 1989. 
is when they officially met, but they were not officially together yet. So Okay, that's interesting. So they kind of got together when they left the club, you mean? Exactly. So they were actually bestest of friends for the longest of time. And you know how club mate is when a boy and a girl are best friends, it's instant rumors of, oh my God, they're together. Uh, And everybody thought they were together, but they were really just best friends. And then as the time came for them to leave, they realized, oh, hey, I'm leaving, you're leaving. Like, I think there's more there than we're we're admitting to ourselves and they decided to get together and they left Club Med together and started a life in San Francisco. And of course, my dad hops back and forth between Canada and, and uh, California to visit his family. But yeah, so. Well, not only that, in the early days, I guess geo relationships were slightly frowned upon. Like I was terrified my first season because I kept hearing from the chief that you know, you're not really allowed to have them. So I was terrified of having, getting a girlfriend really. So, yeah. <laughs> so I lived in fear. So there was also that too, maybe depending. My parents told me about that and I'm shocked because oh, yeah. these days uh, you have what we call joint contract. So you can actually yes. go to a village together. As long as you admit to corporate that you're together, you can make it happen. But yeah, back in the day, they said it was frowned upon. The villages would try to break you up. And I said, what? That's it's crazy to me. Like, how yeah. can you do that? That's just not morally but it, correct. But but hearing, hearing the words joint contract takes all the fun out of sneaking around though. Now, now that, now that I hear it, okay. <laughs> <laughs> because of some, 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 some chiefs would say you could do it, but you know, if I don't find out about it the whole season, then you're really good. You know, some, some, so right. some would take that as a challenge. You know? <laughs> right. No PDA, make exactly. sure you're just yes. about it. As long as you're giving just as much well, attention to the guests as you are your significant other, you know? uh, Yeah. Well, I bring this up constantly that it's funny that, you know, the PDA, like you can't hug or kiss your girlfriend, but every other guy in the village can. So I always thought that was silly, yes. you know, like <laughs> that, they're, honestly, honestly, there's such a double standard. I yes, just, exactly. <laughs> I can't, I still, it's still to this day, there's a double standard. I mean, between the three villages that I worked in, there was that one consistency and it was the club med spirit and double standards. So <laughs> So now, so now when you get a boyfriend, you know, in San Francisco, are you going to still say yeah, you're in couple or you're just going to say that's my boyfriend? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I got to test him out first to see if I even want to <laughs> label him as a boyfriend. But, okay. You're right. Uh, you're right. It's got, yeah. it's got to pass a few XGOs tests, I'm sure. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, like you took care of most of the beginning of my questions because, you know, we now know how you found out about Club Med. So you have a very, very interesting backstory. I did, I did not yeah. know all that. That's pretty incredible. It's really fun. I mean, to have parents who were geos, um, you know, I think sometimes families are a little curious about what their children are doing when they join Club Med if they don't know what it is before. They don't understand the long hours or the fact that you have your day job, but then you also have your night job and you're not just doing your day job, but in an hour or two, you could be in a costume and you're entertaining, you're enjoying a drink with the guests, you're enjoying a meal with them. And so it's a weird concept to wrap your head around, but it was fortunate for me because my parents, they knew exactly what I was going through. And in, in, in fact, they were living vicariously through me. They said, oh man, I wish we could be Chios again. Man, that was the best time in my life. That was the best years of my life. And now we're doing this boring thing called life. And so it's really great that I was able to be a part of a family that was so welcoming and um, understanding of the idea of Club Med, which just made it that much easier. But yeah, it was... Uh, it's been very fun for so, sure. Seeing as how you're kind of a legacy now. So when you're applying to Club Ed, is there a space on the forum to put legacy? Like, did they still interview you? Did you get an interview? I mean, they did interview okay. me. I had, I had two interviews. One was a first initial, tell me about yourself over a Skype call. And then the second one was an official, this would be your manager. This would be your G5 if you had joined the meetings and events team. And so actually the woman who interviewed me, she had no idea who my father was at all. And I, I wanted it that way. Personally, I wanted to make a name for myself because I knew that the second I got to Club Med, there could be that potential, I guess what you say, mentality about being a legacy and Sometimes that can be misconstrued. It could be good or it could be bad. You know, there's expectations set on you. And I knew that once I joined Club Med, if I had joined, people would eventually start finding out that my dad was who he was and my parents were who who they were. 
so I actually didn't promote it that much of who they were. It, it only came out if it came up in a conversation, but I didn't want to boast or brag or anything and say, oh, this is who my parents are. This is what it is because I didn't want to be known for that because even without really saying much, once people found out that my dad was the chief of circus before, and he's now the expert, it was instantly oh my God, so you've done circus your whole life. You know, why aren't you doing it here? But your dad this, your dad that. And so I was always under my parents' shadow. So having an interview where the uh, the interviewer didn't know who I was, it was great because I wanted to make a name for myself. So that's what I did. And, and people knew who my, who my dad was. And of course, when he would come to the villages to do his yearly, his annual checks, people would meet him and I would introduce him as who he is. And I was very proud of that. And, um, but yeah, no, I, they didn't know who I was. They didn't even know who my parents were. So it was great. (laughs) So I guess it's only when someone noticed your last name and his last name, they asked if there was any relation. Yes, exactly. Some would say, "Hmm, wait, I know, uh, do you know Stefan? And I would say, yeah, that's my dad. And (laughs) some would even say, hey, do you know Lily? And I'm like, yeah, that's my mom. And then all of a sudden, all of the memories and all the stories would come out. More stories maybe than I wanted to hear. (laughs) Yes, okay. No, because I don't really want to know about what my parents did when they were my age. Exactly. Um, Well, speaking of, of, did your dad, like, just a quick side question. Did your dad give you the standard uh, warning, like, uh, about, about mail geos or or (laughs) did that come up (laughs) well yes and no uh my dad he was one of those we call silent sharks i think we could say and mom was always very on well our family's very honest just to begin with we share everything and anything with each other so they told me some stories about when they were geos and my mom always said you know i let your dad have his fun I had a little crush on him deep down inside, but I let him have his fun. But what I want you to do is I don't want you to get hung up on on one guy and just be just be careful because you never know guys who work in resorts who are there for the fun and the sun and the girls. You just never know. And, and, And I said, okay, thanks mom. That's awesome advice. I'll be mindful. And then I go to my dad expecting that he's going to say, you know, be careful now, don't do this, or giving me his wisely wisdom advice from his days when he was my age. All he said was, have fun. I said, oh. (laughs) Wow. Okay. (laughs) He's a a much, much bigger man, much bigger man than I am. Oh, boy. (laughs) No, well, I think for him, he... uh, for him, he always, I'm always, I've always been a very strong character in regards to, I guess you could say, protecting myself. So not just being completely open, right, right from the, from the, from the gate, making sure that I'm not completely putting myself out there right away. It's kind of feeling the situation, feeling the person. And if I feel uncomfortable with it, then I would go with it. And so my dad actually always said my entire life, oh, I'm not worried about Sydney. She can hold her own. She, she'll tell someone how it is if she doesn't like it, or, you know, she might seem quiet at first, but once she's comfortable with you, she'll definitely open up. And so he always said, Oh, I'm not worried about her at all. She can hold her own. So I think that's why he said, have fun because he, my entire life, he always said I can hold my own. So it was just funny because I got it more from my mom than I did my dad. So yeah. (laughs) Cool. (laughs) They're pretty cool parents, to be honest. I mean, my mom was a professional ballerina before she became a nurse and my dad was a chef and then he became a professional flying trapeze artist and they both have their own stories and lives that I mean I could go on and on about what they did so to have such fun and creative and different parents it it led for a very fun life so well, well maybe you can convince them to come on the show at a later date maybe you could oh, work absolutely. on them for me the way, the, oh my gosh the way, the way Jim the way Jim asked you you know <laughs> <laughs> Jim in quotes. Yes. Jim in quotes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, I'm sure they would love to. So. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Now let's get back to so what made you decide to want to do um like meeting and events coordinator? What in your background said, you know what? I want to do that really hard job because I've <laughs> I've done that for a few years and it's um I'm I am I want to do ask you about hor- horror stories after when you know something yeah. you plan something that goes wrong. But what made you say, hey, I want to go into that? Well, I actually was due to my parents. Um, They own a circus school in Oakland, California. And that circus school is where I grew up. 
you know, your parents take you to a playground, but my parents took me to the circus school. So I grew up hanging out, playing there. I mean, that was, that was my life when I was younger. And there would be always performances that my parents' business would get hired for, private events and things like that around the Bay Area. And I would always tag along on these events, whether I was the performer or if I was just the extra help for my parents, I would always go to these events. And I was actually more mesmerized by the events than anything and the decorations and the setup and just the technicalities of an event. I was always so mesmerized by everything. And so I said, mom, I think I, I think I really gravitate towards events. I love decorating. I love being creative. She said, well, you know, that's a thing. I mean, people are event planners and there's so many different routes you can go in the world with event planning. There's so many different ways you can do it. And so that was always in the back of my mind. And then I got to college. I went to um, Oregon State University, go Beavs. Really? And it was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And I had an amazing time there. And they actually had a program to create and design your own major. And I, my mom always said, uh, what's what? this? Are you uh, serious? Yeah. My mom always said, I'm the was it square peg trying to fit into a round hole or the other, <laughs> right, vice versa, you know, whatever that saying is. And I never wanted to do something that was what you always hear somebody doing. And so there was the um, College of Liberal Arts. They had to design your own, build your own degree program, which basically means that you can you know, think of an industry that you want to be a part of, but if the college doesn't necessarily offer it, then we can create it. So I would pick classes from different colleges that the school already offers, and I would build a degree. And then from there, I would send an, an, I guess, an essay, you could say, essay, what's the word, maybe more like an essay introduction to what I want to do, and give an explanation of why I want to do this, what I think I can do with it, why do I think those particular classes I picked would be relevant to what I want to study. They approved it. And so here we are. My official degree was a liberal studies degree with an emphasis in event coordination and production. Wow. So from there, I said, I want to do something in the event industry. (laughs) Yeah. And uh, I always had club med in the back of my mind. My parents always said, oh, you, you should be the one that you know, does that. You should be the one that does something related to uh, to meetings and events. Uh, I'm sure that Club Med has something. And at the time I was like, I really don't think that Club Med has a meetings and events thing or anything related to that. And I looked into it. I applied and my parents always said, you know what, even if you don't do meetings and events, even if it's not an option, you need, you need to do it. Of all the three kids in the family, you're the one with the personality. You can do it. And I always said, no, I really don't want to. Like, I don't want to join Club Med. I don't want to do what my parents did. You know, what kid wants to do what their parents did? I mean, not many anyway. And then college graduation came around and I was looking for a job and something just came over me. And I said, maybe I really should do Club Med. And I applied without telling my parents, actually. I didn't want to tell them until I got the job because I didn't want to get their hopes up and get them really excited. And I got the job. And in the interview, I was actually applying for a reception position. And they had looked at my resume and said, wait, we see that you have a lot of meetings and events, what's the word, experience on your resume. Uh, You know that we have a meetings and events department. I said, I had no idea. And they said, yeah, well, would you like us to put you in the, the pool for that instead of reception? I said, yes, please, absolutely. And sure enough, four months later, after I applied, they had a position opening up in Sandpiper. So that's how it happened. And uh, just a quick side question. Did you yeah. go before you started working at Club Med? Did, did you or your parents ever go to a Club Med on vacation? Oh, yeah. That was it, the okay. only vacation we did. Oh, my goodness. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. We, my parents love the concept of all inclusive, regardless whether it's Club Med or not. But because of their direct connection to Club Med, that is all we did. We just did Club Med vacations ever since I was six months old. Okay, so you were a baby club and mini club and teen club all the way. Oh, and I hated mini club. Okay, <laughs> Every, everybody does. No, just I hated <laughs> it. I my actually my brother and sister loved it, but I hated it. I my parents would try to drop me off, and I would be the one that would throw the tantrum okay. and I wouldn't want to be dropped off. And so my parents <laughs> were like, "Oh, come on now, we know what you're trying to do. We're gonna leave you there." And I said, "Good luck with that." And I would just throw the tantrum the second they would leave. And then the mini club geos would call my parents and say, she's not stopping. You got to come and get her. And so, yeah, <laughs> it was, uh, it was fun though. It was really fun. 
All right, you get so you get to the village your first week. Were you immediately thrown into like a massive event, or did that come a few weeks later? What was your first real big one? First real big one. Well, when I arrived, it wasn't immediate. I mean, what was immediate was the geo life. So I arrived in Sandpiper around six, seven o'clock at night, maybe. And my manager welcomed me in her fabulousness. Uh, she's just a fabulous person. If she's hearing, she knows who I'm talking about. And she showed up in her high heels and her really cute, elegant outfit for the night. And she said, okay, I'm going to bring you to the room. Great. Here I am with my three ginormous suitcases. And my manager is with me, like, you know, dragging them along in her high heels to my room. And we get to the room and I get a little settled in and she says, you know, if you want to go to dinner, I'll let you get changed. Uh, here's the dress code for the night. If you want to stay in though, let me know. And we can start fresh tomorrow. And I said, no, no, no. I want to go right in. Let's go. And from the moment that I arrived, I started. So we had dinner. We already had, you know, dinner with some guests. And then I hung out at the party a little bit. And the first thing I actually saw were the crazy signs. And it's so funny to me because when you're on the guest side of it versus the geo side of it, it's so different. And when I saw that in the bar, I said, oh my goodness, here I am. It really hit me in that moment. I said, I'm in Club Med. Okay, let's go. And so someone said, oh, come on, let's do the crazy signs. And I was actually a little bit nervous to do it because I didn't know really any of them besides hands up. And they said, well, that's the fun of it. You just get thrown into it and you just do it. And the more you do it, the more you, you know, you know it and you get with it. So I said, okay, why not? So here we are. This is the Club Med Geo Life. So I went right into it and then didn't stay out too late. I know that's completely unheard of for a, for a Geo, but I went to bed, woke up the next morning, and then we really started all the meetings and events things. So I was on a team of three and we just kind of started the initial, what is meetings and events in Club Med? What are you responsible for? What do you do? And then from there, they showed me the calendar of what's coming up, who's coming in. And we went from there. So what kind of companies would, what kind of companies would come to, to Sandpiper, like just out of curiosity to plan events, were they banks? Oh my gosh, all sorts of companies from all over the world. So there's a few villages in the world that are pretty big in meetings and events off the top of my head. I know that Sandpiper 60% of the village is meetings and events groups. And I also believe OPO in France is really big for groups as well. Uh, there's a village in Brazil, I think it's Rio, where that village is really big as well for groups. So there's, you know, designated villages that are really big for it. And so from my understanding, those are the villages that get the biggest and most name brand companies. And so when I was in Sandpiper, we had L'Oreal come in, we had Bacardi come in, even it was either, I want to say it was Papa John's Pizza or it was Domino's. That was my coworker. He was responsible for that one. I, I had helped him out a little bit with that group, but I believe it was that group. We had some French banks come in as well. Then there were some smaller companies, uh, insurance companies, even construction companies, roofing companies. So it was much smaller, not so name brand companies, but we had so many different ones come in. So my job was dealing with the CEOs and the group leaders of those groups and basically being responsible for them through and through from their arrival to their departure. I'm their liaison. I give them my work phone number and I say, you can contact me whenever you need me and I can make sure things are happening for you besides the pre-prep that I had already done for the group. So if they had a reservation in the restaurant or if they had a private dinner or a private cocktail party and things like that. All right. Now I love and hate when things go wrong. Like I'm a perfectionist, <laughs> but you realize you could plan to the, you know, kingdom come, but something's going to go wrong. Oh, so do you, do you have an example of something that no, that no matter how much you planned it, something went wrong? Like, a, like, like how, how long were you at Sandpiper your first season? I was there for a year. Okay. So, so did anything go wrong in that year? Um, During an event, I mean? Uh, yeah, there's a few. Uh, a few. So, <laughs> you don't have to say the names or you know, change no. the particulars, just what what exactly. Oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm like you. I'm, I am a perfectionist. And I had to slowly learn that in events, 
it can never be perfect. There will always be something that goes wrong, even if it's not major, even if it's not detrimental to the event or the group, something will go wrong. So I had to learn pretty quickly, just you know, be as prepared as you can be, be prepared for the moment that something could go wrong and just be proactive. So there was an incident, actually, we had a wedding in Sandpiper and there's a gazebo. I'm not sure if you're familiar with where this gazebo is located, but it's along the water closer to the marina side of the village. And we always have our weddings there. And of course, in typical Florida fashion, it started raining. And so we had to move it into our, what we call Atlantic ballroom, which is where we have all of our indoor conferences. It's not the prettiest room for a wedding, honestly, compared to the beautiful Florida sunsets and, you know, beautiful landscape and greenery, but we had to make it work. So sure enough, we bring everything into the room and everything's set up. I'm like, okay, this actually looks really good. Good job, team. High five. Great. And we close up for the night, go to bed, wake up the next morning, come in to get everything ready. And the room is soaking wet. And we're like, oh my gosh, what happened? And we look, there were ceiling tiles that completely fell overnight. They completely got soaked from leaking from the roof or something. And some of them were smashed on the beautiful tables, round tables that we set up. There were some smashed all over the floor. There was water everywhere. I mean, it was a disaster. We all look at each other and we say, well, great. And the rain's not stopping. So th th this doesn't look like it's going to stop. So we all had to come together and uh, it was the most tacky thing I ever saw, but we had to move the tables around where the leaks were happening. And then we had to put the prettiest bucket we could find in the middle of the room to catch <laughs> the water <laughs> with a little Pretty, bow decoration. Prettiest bucket. It. Okay, God, I love this. Yeah. Keep, going, keep going. Okay. <laughs> prettiest bucket. And we had to leave the bucket there during the wedding because even if, I mean, the rain was ongoing during the day, but once the wedding started, it had stopped, but there was still you know, rain left over on the roof. And so it wouldn't stop. So during the entire wedding, we had this mess and we tried to make a pretty mess out of it, but it only worked so much. So now why did this, ha like, why did it happen? Is it, was it an exceptionally strong rain that, that fell or just didn't stop it? It was raining for hours. Like, why did it decide there and then, you know, the roof <laughs> to like, uh, was it an old building or was it just because it was yeah. raining so much? No, I mean, well, you know, they do say if it rains on wedding day, then it's good luck. Is so it? we, uh, that's what I've heard. I don't okay. know if that's the terminology I heard in the event world to okay. make the clients a little bit more relaxed when it starts raining on their wedding day. Okay. That's right. You have to talk them down. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. I get it. You have okay. to talk them down from <laughs> becoming a bridezilla if they're not already. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or a groomzilla. Groomzilla is a thing too. There, there are groomzillas? There are groomzillas. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I guess because Not, if the wife doesn't want to be the bad cop, then she sends in the groom, right? To be yeah, the bad cop. Okay. Yeah. It's not as frequent, but it's there. Uh, yeah. Okay. So actually, I mean, I'm not dogging Sandpiper whatsoever, mm -hmm. but everybody knows who's worked there that it's an old village and it's had renovations, but uh, not to the level that it probably should um and so yeah they i guess this the roof was not in good condition okay. i'm no expert in construction so i have no idea but from the moment that i arrived to when i had left the condition of the roof was the same and so it was always like that it didn't matter how hard it was raining or how little it was raining if there was any form of water hitting that roof we were having leaks but i think that particular day we had so much rain it was I think a tropical storm actually, that it really came down because normally we can control it pretty well. But that day it just was coming down, tiles falling everywhere. So it was quite the, it was quite the event, but there's well, so many other stories too. It's just, I can well, well, you know, you know, what jinxed you was you did the celebratory high five pat on your back. And from that moment on, you know, it was like, uh Oh, maybe we should have waited, you know, like, so I think that, <laughs> I think, I think you jinxed yourself there. <laughs> Probably. When you're doing Probably. events, just when you think it's going to go right, oh boy, like rain, rain's the worst for an yeah. event. Isn't, yeah. isn't rain or like, did anyone, did you ever make a decision? Like, you know, you just set up the pool, I don't know, for 600 people, rain clouds are coming in. So did you ever have to make that call? Like Sydney, is it going to rain or not? Did this yeah. ever happen? 
Oh God, isn't that the worst? Okay. The worst. <laughs> I mean, I'm not a meteorologist. I have no idea. I'm only using, well, for example, actually in Turks, the, you know, it's tropical weather. So even if the weather says it's not going to rain, it will rain. And even if it says it's raining, it's going to, it's going to be really sunny. So you never knew you could never trust the weather apps, even in Turks. So we would see the clouds and we would judge the weather based on the clouds and the wind. And so we would have a lot of events and there's not many event spaces in Turks uh, that are in doors a lot of the event spaces are outdoors but especially during the winter season there's just so much rain and it's random rain it doesn't last very long but it's pretty random so there were a lot of cocktail parties and uh outdoor events that we had to do that were just oh so so much stress people would come to me left and right sending me messages what are we going to do about the rain what are we going to do what are we going to do and i would say okay this is the time that we're going to make the final call at that time, we will decide if we're going to move it inside, which actually we weren't necessarily allowed to do. Um, there were really, really strict restrictions for the COVID protocols. We could only move it inside a certain amount of minutes before the event was supposed to start because it had to be considered a backup plan, basically. So there was just so many logistics and so many uh, restrictions we had to follow and rules we had to follow that we really had to be respectful to those rules and we tried to keep it outside as much as possible. So whether that was like an indoor outdoor space, if it was using the theater, if it was using the check-in reception arrival area, we had to get creative, but there were some moments where we didn't have a choice and we would have to figure either cancel, figure out something else or, but they would always come to me. And I looked at the sky and I said, I have no clue. I have no idea what we're supposed to do here. It's going to be this huge setup for this huge group, which means we're going to have to rally the entire team to move everything, but we don't have enough time to do it if I have to do it in the time frame that I'm given. So it was always this back and forth. What are we going to do? Yeah. Well, couldn't when people ask you about the weather, couldn't you just say, look, I'm geo, not G-O-D? Couldn't you just say that? (laughs) Or, or if you, only, if only okay. that was the okay. truth. But you know, you know, when you're a geo, you're pretty much an everything geo. Yeah. You do everything. Yeah, you have to have the answer for everything. What temperature is the yeah. pool? What temperature is the ocean? Yeah, you have to have an answer, or else yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you have to know what you're talking about, even so, if you have no idea. So. so, did you go from Sandpiper to Turks, or did you? No, did you, I went did you resort from Sandpiper in between? to Cancun. And okay. Cancun to Turks. All right. Interesting. All nice in villages. Three very different villages. I was so happy with the experience I had with Club Med because I got such a well-rounded experience. Of course, I didn't do a winter village, but just between Sandpiper, Cancun, and Turks, each one was so different in regards to location, dynamic of the team, everything like that. So I really think I got a well-rounded experience between the three, and it was really fun. I love it. I still love it. I do miss it, but right now I'm not really feeling a sense of FOMO or anything because I did so much in those three villages that I really feel like I got almost everything I could have out of those three. Well, yeah. And because you're from beautiful San Francisco, if you're from Montreal, like me looking out at snow right now, you might be FOMO. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I sure do in the winter. I always think about Club Med, especially in the winter. Funny enough, I have a lot of Canadian friends who they were always talking about the weather and I knew about the weather in Canada when I would visit my family in Laval, but most of my life I grew up in San Francisco where unless you drive north a few hours north, you're really not experiencing any rain or any snow in San Francisco, or even if you go south, you never experience that. And so all my Canadian friends would always talk about the weather. And funny enough, closer to my end of Turk's time, I was craving snow. Yeah. And I had no idea why. And I think it's because it was the coziness of it. And I wanted that fireplace, you know, having your blanket with your hot cocoa or your tea and just being able to watch the snow fall. And my, all my friends were say, saying, you're absolutely insane. Why would you want that? And I said, well, I mean, consider the source. I grew up in California where you don't really ever have that unless you drive a bit to get it. And uh, so, yeah. Well, I have a it feeling was, that the uh, the chief of village of Club Med uh, Charlevoix is listening to this. He's going to call you if you want to work there <laughs> since you you like cozy fires. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Francis. You might I get a call. You. Okay. <laughs> you, now, I love you. You're awesome, chief. <laughs> oh, you know the chief uh, at I Club do. Med yeah, Charlevoix? Francis. 
Francis. Oh, okay. Yeah, he was my chief in Turks. He was oh, actually okay. one of my favorites. And uh, between him and Kareem, who now actually works in Miami, I had amazing, amazing seasons with them. They were awesome. So. Kareem Dos Santos? Kareem Fajir. Oh, Fajir. Okay. Okay. Wow. And now, how did you get to, like, is, is your mom from San Francisco? She is born in oh, okay. So you're Francisco. very, your dad's very, very smart. Okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> he chose, you had, to, you had to choose to live between Montreal or California. Yeah, I think he made the right choice. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I really think between Canada and the U.S., you have the best of both worlds. I mean, you do. You do. Do you have dual well, citizenship? I actually, I'm hoping I do, you do have. Oh, I do have dual citizenship. I have two passports. I'm looking at my passports right now. Actually, good for you. That's yeah. no, that's something. I can jealous. hop between the two, and I have the best of both worlds. So, oh. wow, this has been amazing so far. I don't. I don't <laughs> know what to ask you next. Like, uh, like. Oh, like, please. I'm, I was, I, like I said, I was telling you earlier before the interview, I can write a book. Okay. I have so much to share. I love All right. Sharing. So other than, other than like horror stories and events and planning, do you ever, do you have any funny, uh, it's hard It's because with you, it's difficult because you, you, you basically grew up in club med. So you didn't really have any culture shock. You knew what to expect. So did anything True. remotely funny happen in, in any of your villages? Like, uh, yes, quite a lot, actually. Okay. Tell me. please. <laughs> well, this isn't, personally well it's my story because I was involved in it but it wasn't personally my group so one of my co-workers in San Iber, he had a older group that came to visit and it was probably people ranging in the age of I want to say like late 60s to mid 80s and so when we learned the dynamic and the age of the group we looked at each other and we said okay this is going to be either really, really interesting in a good way or really, really interesting in a bad way. We had no idea what we were going to get with this group because they only tell us so much before the groups arrive and to be able to prepare for them. But you don't really know until we introduce ourselves and we meet them. So there was this old group that came in. They, I guess, come every single year and some need more help than others due to their old age. And my friend, he gave them his phone number because he was mainly responsible for them and he got a, a phone call one night from the group leader of the group and said hey this woman from this room she needs help taking a bath can you please help her do that oh boy and he <laughs> he said look I'm I told you I would help you with anything you need but that's where I draw the line I'm, I'm not giving old ladies baths I'm so <laughs> sorry I'm that's, that's not, that's not my job, basically. And he, he said it in the nicest way possible. But afterwards, he came to us and just said, I just got the weirdest request. And he told us, yeah, the group leader asked me to give this woman a bath for her. And we just cracked up. We were laughing for a long time, actually, because he's the, he's always the one that gets the groups with the craziest requests. And so for us at this point, it was nothing new. We always were wondering, okay, when he walks in the office, what is it going to be today? What is he going to tell us that he was requested of today? And it was always his groups. And it was so funny that we heard that. For me, I guess there was one woman who was really into meditation, Zen, just that whole concept of being relaxed and things like that. And so she told me, you know, the room is great, but there's not a lot of feng shui in this room. I said, okay, what do you mean by, I mean, I know what feng shui is, but what do you mean? Like, what about the room is not feng shui? Well, there's just not enough plants in here and it's just not flowing right. I'm not getting a good flow. And I said, okay, how can I help you with the flow? Because that's what I'm trained to do. I have to be there to help. I have to be there to assist and make them feel like they're being heard. And so she said, you know, I need you to go find a plant for me. I said, a plant, like a, a, in a, uh, like a small plant, like a vase of flowers, or she said, no, 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 like go find a plant on the property and undig it, like dig it out of the ground and then put it in a pot for me and bring it to me. And I, oh, I said, look, kind of bite, uh, I'm, biting, I'm biting my tongue here. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> I said, look, I, I want to do that for you, but I am far from allowed to rip up plants on the property. The landscapers work really hard on this. I, I can't just dig up plants and find a pot for you and put in a pot for you. I'm more than happy to run to the store for you and buy one for you, but I just, I can't start ripping up plants. And she said, oh no, no, no. Then in that case, I don't want it. I said, okay. 
All right. Well, if you need anything else to help me make your room, uh, help you make your room more feng shui, let me know. And she said, great, we'll do. Never heard about it again. But after I said, what? I, I reflected on the conversation after and I was just, okay, sure. Oh, that that right. happens. Back, back, and that's, there, not, yeah. There was no feng shui back I'm in my not, day. And I, we would have said, you're lucky there's no cockroaches in this room and be grateful for it. That's what we would have said probably. <laughs> yeah. And I've gotten the calls at 2 a.m., 3 a.m. Because that's a part of our job. We have to give our number. Our phone so number, uh, are you saying you guys have cell phones on you? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So, well, my God. Okay. Well, at the time when I was in meetings and events, we were using our own personal phones and then closer to the end of my year, we were doing a meeting, a reflection of the year. And we were speaking to the then meetings and events expert of the zone at the time. We said, look, you know, we're asked to give our, our phone numbers to these clients, but we're not getting paid. Like our phone bills are not getting paid for using our personal phones. And we're doing a lot of business on our phones. And so they said, no, that that's fair. We do ask you to give them your phone number. And I said, okay, well then can we maybe consider either you pay our phone bill or you provide us a work phone? And so sure enough, they gave us a work phone. So we were able to give them, and not every service has a work phone, only certain services, but they were able to approve that for meetings and events. So we were able to give them a, a work phone number and that's what they would call. And we would get so many different calls and texts asking for so many random things at any hour of the day. It was really interesting. So I'm sure myself, a lot of uh, older geos are like so jealous that, well, it's weird to say that everyone had a phone now because we wish that we would have had that technology back then. So it must be so cool just to like call, like call your parents, right? Like if you wanted oh to, gosh, like, yeah. cause we didn't have that. We had to leave someplace, spend a lot of money to, yeah. you know, wait I in mean, line. The <laughs> outstanding rule between all the villages was don't show your phone. Don't have the guests see you using your phone if you want you can go to the corner hide if you need to use your phone i mean don't be on your phone in public okay. but you were certain services you really used your phone for communication if it was through whatsapp facebook messenger calling even i mean that was our main form of communication between the services for an immediate response and uh of course also calling our families and things like that i mean i know when my mom was a geo she said they would get really excited when they got a fax. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and for me, I'm like a fax machine. Like, I know what that is. But, you know, now this, in this day and age, everything is so immediate. It's so instant. So for me to have to think about waiting for a fax to come in and you would get so excited when it finally did, it's just so much different now. So we do have phones. We can't show it that much during the day, but we, yes, we had phones available to us. So... Yeah. Yes, I, I I remember the faxes, and of course the reception team liked it because some people that visited and wrote you were you know held nothing black uh, back, so some were pretty explicit these faxes. So I'm sure they had a big chuckle at uh, at these faxes <laughs> coming in. It's crazy to think about. Uh, wow. All right. <laughs> were, were, were there any employees or managers like other than ones you mentioned? Like, was there certain chiefs of villages you clicked more with others? Like, um, yeah. Um, I mean, I think we all know that your team is only as good as that season that you're with that team. It's always going to be different, even though the mentality of club med is the same, no matter which village you go to, you know, the team is the team that season and it changes once you go through the rotation. And so I had actually in my three years, I was adding it up the other day and I had seven chiefs in three years. Wow. And I was like, that's a lot of turnover. That's a lot of chiefs in seven years. And there were two that I loved, got along with amazingly loved. They made my seasons in those villages amazing. I had two others who I had great respect for and they liked me, I liked them. And so it made my that season very enjoyable. And then there were a couple that I did not get along with and not get along with in, in regards to, you know, we were fighting or anything. I just didn't necessarily like their form of management, or I didn't like the way that they were treating the geos or just kind of the speech that they would use or the form of communication they would use with us. So there were definitely a, a few that had their own unique way of doing things. And yeah. Do you want was, to mention yeah. the, um, cause you, you, you talked well of 
your first um, manager at Sandpiper. From, yeah. uh, did you want to say her name? Because I think of that course. I think that if you're speaking well of someone that, you know, we, we never really get the time or we forget to thank them. So if they are listening, yeah. I, I think yes. it'd be nice. Her name is Agnes. She uh, is actually now, I believe, working in Cancun, but she's been in Club Med for a while now as well. And she really welcomed me into the Club Med world. She really helped to you know, with meetings and events, it was a concept that I knew and loved, but she really gave me that introduction to it, to be successful with it in Club Med. And it was because of her that I feel like I was so successful in Club Med. She really provided me that good source of a good foundation, basically, to make meetings and events my own once I took it over in Turks and once I took it over in Cancun. So it was because of her that you know, her training that really helped. So thank you to her. She really helped introduce me to that world besides what I had already known. It was, uh, she was really instrumental in that. So. Well, I guess, I, I guess I'm going to catch some flack if I don't ask you about like, cause you've, you've actually just worked in, in a climate resort in the time of uh, COVID, right? So yeah. how, for, for those who haven't been able to go, like, are there, like when you go in the restaurant, are there any rules that you have to follow or? Yes. When, so I started November, we opened November 28th of 2020 and I arrived November 15th of 2020. So it was all that preliminary stages of getting the village reopened, bringing out all the furniture again, setting everything up, getting everything in order. But the biggest thing was the COVID regulations. And, you know, it was a risk at that time. The vaccine still wasn't a thing yet. It was being discussed, it was being created, but it was a risk to go to a foreign country. And the country of Turks is very strict on their regulations. So that did ease my nerves a little bit with traveling during the the pandemic. So internationally anyway, not so much domestically. And the regulations were really strict. I mean, we got there and everything was about touching each other's elbows. You know, we're not doing the hugs anymore. We're not doing the handshakes, which is so weird in Club Med because you connect with so many people. And when you see them again, you want to hug them. You want to say, oh my gosh, hi, it's so nice to see you. And we couldn't hug. We couldn't do any of that. So it was the elbow touching. We always had to wear the mask, whether it was indoors or outdoors. There were distancing rules. So we could only be one to a table when we were eating uh, breakfast and lunch in the geo section. We couldn't be sitting with each other. Uh, we had to always have our temperature checked, uh, wearing the, uh, the hand sanitizer. There was just so many regulations everywhere. And so when we arrived, we were all really excited because we'd been stuck in quarantine for, for me, it was nine months. And so I was so excited to be one on a beautiful Island, but also to be with friends, old friends, and now new friends have socialization again, which I'm sure many people can understand. And but it was still nerve wracking because we didn't know what was going to happen. And I know that when the pandemic started, it was an everyday thing. It was something new every single day. So it was the same thing. Once we reopened and we're trying to get things in place, the guests are really excited to be there, but everyone was also really hesitant because we didn't know what we were allowed to do. We didn't know what we should do. I mean, they gave us a presentation on the rules and the regulations and what we're going to do now, but you only understand it so much when it's on a PowerPoint versus once it's in person. So it was really interesting. It was quite a transition. It was something new every day. The Island of Turks changed every month. They had a, I guess you can say a conference or a, like a live conference to tell the Island what the rules are going to be for that month. So it was month to month that we had to follow regulations. And so we would have to change activities in the village. We would have to change protocols month by month just to comply with the Island. And it was a roller coaster. I I can admit it was not easy at times. It was stressful at times, especially for me, for meetings and events, there's capacity rules in the meeting rooms. We can only have so many people inside a meeting room at one time. So that was stressful. We could only have so many people gathering outside. So there's so many things we had to consider. And it was always roller coaster up and down, up and down. What what is it going to be today? It was it was a lot. What's it like doing a marathon? It was really fun because we finally got to be in that Sorry, I was going to ask you, what, what, uh, what's it like doing a, a marathon a crazy science session in a mask? like? <laughs> oh, yes, the crazy science. I can't believe I forgot about that. So it was crazy science, but with distance. So imagine oh. you're putting your arms out 
And so we had to do all of our events outdoors. Fortunately, Turks is primarily an outdoor village. I mean, it's pretty much indoor outdoor. There's not really any indoor locations besides the restaurant and uh, maybe the meeting room. That's pretty much it. So we would do all of, we actually started in the theater because the theater provided the most space and we would put our arms out to the sides and we would say, okay, you know, we're going to do crazy signs like this. And so we would make dance moves with our hands out to the sides. So it, it would force us to have to separate between each other. And then that's how we did crazy signs for a little while, actually, with just a lot of distance between each other, wearing masks, making sure that there's all that distance and uh, respect for each other's bubble. So we still did it, but it was weird. It was not how Club Med normally is at all, but I mean, they made it work for what it was and they made it as normal as possible, but with respect to, you know, COVID. Now, did you find, I only got one or two questions left. Did you find that any of your seasons like was magical in any way? Was it your first season at Sandpiper because it was your first or do you just like them all like do you like Sandpiper, Cancun, and Turks just for different reasons? Or is there one that stood out was more special than the others? Overall, I think I can say I've liked each village in its own for something different. I loved each place for its uniqueness. So overall, I love each one for its own special thing. But I want to say definitely my first season in Sandpiper was magical. It was because it was the new, it was the first season. It was new for me. It was a new experience. It was enlightening, even though I knew what I was getting myself into. It's never the same. Like I said, when you're a GM versus when you're a geo, you see two different sides of it. So that was a really magical season for me. Just the people, how I met so many different people in such a short amount of time, the different personalities, the cultures, the stories I heard. It was, wow, I never realized you're in one place for honestly not that long of a time and you meet so many people and you compare that to the real world where you're not meeting nearly as many people like that uh, on a normal basis. So that was really, that was a cool concept for me to embrace. So I loved that. Cancun, I loved the culture and the people. I loved the location of Cancun. On my days off, I would always try to go out of the village and I would love to go explore where I live. That was my biggest thing was exploring where I was because I wanted to make the most of my time in that place. So I absolutely loved the people, the culture, the food, and the village itself is beautiful. And then Turks was just, it's Turks. You know, you always heard about Turks. Everyone always said, oh gosh, it's the beach is beautiful. And the village is fun because it's adults only. And all these little things that I always heard about, though COVID was a thing, you still felt that essence of Turks. And so I loved Turks even was really magical for me. It was one of those years that I was I was actually skeptical to come back to Club Med after the pandemic because I said, do I really want to go back? I was really evaluating if I wanted to go back. And my intuition said, no, you need to go back. At least if it's just for this one last year, something was telling me, go to Turks. You have to do it. And I'm so glad I did. It was amazing. It was really magical. The island, the adults only, especially the GMs that I met, quote, coming in gym our mutual friends. Yes, Jim. <laughs> Jim. Uh, no, but there's so many different people that I met. And like I said, every village you go to, you meet amazing people, but there was something about Turks where I don't know if it was the beach vibes. I don't know if it was the adults only vibe. I don't know what it was. It was a Jojo it, vibe. Did you meet Jojo? Yeah, there you go. I like that. Okay. It, I did meet Jojo. Oh, I good. actually met Jojo four or five times. I was really lucky. But there's something, there's this Jojo vibe in the air and it made everybody happy and everybody wanted to be there. And I loved exploring everything about the island and I love the island life, island people, that mentality. So I'd say there's something magical about each one. That's why I said, I really don't regret anything that I had done in Club Med. I'm so happy with the experience I had. It was one of those things where you never understand it until you do it. But also that connection you have with the other geos, like that geo connection is so strong because nobody will ever understand what you went through except another geo. And that's why I value the friendships that I've made in Club Med so much and the people that I met, whether GM or geo, because it's that connection that only you guys can understand. It's been, it it was amazing. It was amazing. All right. One last question before I let you go. And I'm really sorry. I'm monopolized a lot of your time. So I'm really sorry. Oh no. But uh, this has been very interesting. I love being here. I love talking about it. I love sharing my story. So that's why I agreed to be here today. 
before I let you go, is there anything like I, I didn't uh, ask you or you wanted to say before I let you go? Like now, now's the time. Like, so I don't know what it is, but like, I don't want to, I don't want to let you go and, unless there's something you wanted to say, or I forgot to ask you, or you wanted to bring up anything, you know, I did, to, anything. or did we just, or did we say it all? <laughs> I feel like we covered it all. Okay. I think so. From this how is, uh, I, yeah. From how I started to where I am today, I think people maybe want to know why did I leave now? I just, it just felt like the time I had done it for three years. I am taking a break. I very well could go back, but for now, after three years of 15 to 16 hours a day, six days a week, and just it being go, 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 always being on, eventually it catches up to you. And because of Club Med, I really feel like I found my voice and I found what I want to do in my life, even more than what I knew before. And so it just felt right. I had done my year in Turks and I really evaluated what I wanted to do next. And I said, you know, even if I just take off six months or even if I take off the year, I just want to try something else out. And people are going to say I'm crazy because why would you want to leave the club med world and go into this boring real world? Because the real world sucks. Yes. For me, honestly, I, I was craving making, I love cooking. So I was craving cooking again and I love driving. So even something as small as driving, I loved just of course, I'm a big family person. So being home with my family, finally for the holidays and for all those major celebrations. So it's just time to take a break. I could very well go back, but for now I'm enjoying being home. I have access to my family's circus school. Of did, course, you want yeah. to, did you want to say the name of their school? Oh yeah. Trapeze Arts. Trapeze Oakland. Arts, Oakland. Okay. Oakland, California. Yeah. So they do, uh, they do classes and they do equipment manufacturing. So if you want to build anything, if you want anything built for you, custom made belts or trapezes or rigs or anything, they do it. That's all handcrafted by my dad. But yeah, I just, I had circus in club med, but it's not the same as the circus school that I have here. So now I get to enjoy the circus school again and I get to see my old friends and hang out with my family and it just, it feels right for now. So that's pretty much everything. Well, you said you wanted to take a break, but didn't you mention that you're, you're starting work soon? Like, yeah, well, <laughs> you have some jobs lined up. Like, should you be relaxing? Well, or something? I'm in between <laughs> jobs, okay. so I have some travel trips lined up. I, I love traveling, so that's a that's number one for me is to be able to travel more. But I do have small jobs here and there, so I do work for an event planning company where they do events you know, maybe a couple, one or two or three times a week. And it's random every month when these events happen, but it's more freelance work. So freelance events. I do also do some babysitting for um, a couple families that I know here in the city, if they need some extra help, and then just also helping my parents at their circus school. So it's not full-time work. It's maybe just part-time work randomly throughout the week, but it's nothing permanent. I'm actually in the midst of looking for a job. So it's going to be a, uh, it's a long process. I'm planning to stay in California for now, unless the job takes me elsewhere, but I'm, I'm looking for a job. So that's the next big venture in my life is the job search. Yeah. I think Francis is calling you in January. So get, <laughs> get ready. <Okay. laughs> I'm actually, I'm actually going to, uh, to Charlevoix or trying to with my family in January. Oh, um, nice. But that's not official yet. I have no idea if or when or if it's possible, but we really do want to go just to say hi to all. I would love to see my friends there and they really want to see Charlevoix. At the same time, I can visit my family in Canada. So it all could work out very perfectly. That, uh, But I will be seeing Francis, so... <laughs> <laughs> who knows yeah, who knows you might not come yeah you might have an extended stay probably right? yeah <laughs> bring up bring a parka just in case okay you never know it's club med. yeah i mean if you know if you know club med, you know it could be tomorrow that you're leaving so that's right well uh sydney i really want to thank you so much for for coming on and sharing your story this has been great it's my pleasure i'm happy to share it and if thank it you. relates to anybody in the real world then i hope it helped or or at least it was entertaining to you so <laughs> definitely it was, and I'm sure it will be to all the listeners. Thanks again so much. Of course. Thank you again. Well, everyone, that was Sydney from San Francisco. We'll see you all next week. Bye. Say bye, Sydney. Bye. <laughs>